Happy day before Friday. Happy Thursday to you and yours. And welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock. I'm your host. And uh, I got a smoke show for you today. I, I got an awesome show. Uh, I've called in virtually all the fearless soldiers. Uh, Delano Squires is going to be here. Shamika Michelle, Royce White, uh, Uncle Jimmy. And uh, we've called in a special volunteer, Glenn Beck. Uh, Glenn Beck is one of the smartest people I know about the U.S. Constitution and a lot of our discussion today is going to focus on the Constitution because uh, they're trying to overthrow the Constitution and by they I'm talking about the left and uh, they got their lawyers out doing work right now and so I I'm not going to waste a bunch of time uh, hyping you up about today's show I'm just going to start this fire bring in these soldiers fan the flames and uh, send you guys along your way as we move closer to the weekend. Uh, comedian Jon Stewart is a member of the Dream Team, the high profile squad of pundits tasked with framing men who died 200 years ago with race crimes committed within the last 60 years. Stewart just might be the Johnny Cochran of the new Dream Team. He is eloquent, clever, and passionate. He's adept at making people believe he believes the bullshit he utters. On the latest episode of The Problem with Jon Stewart, the 59-year-old political commentator argued that the American dream is unattainable for black people. Uh, watch these clips. How crazy. The, the literal interpretation of the American dream is that is it doesn't matter where you were born or how you were born or who you are, that in this country, you can rise up and go beyond that. And it turns out to be a fallacy. But I wonder, you know, when we say, oh, in 2040 or 2050, when the demographic change and we won't know what will happen, I feel like we know what will happen because it's, it's what's happened from the very beginning. And I would say, yeah, the formation of the union, the compromise that was made with the Southern states that black slaves would count as three fifths, but they can't vote, but you can count them. There has always been a redistribution of power to the white elite. And it happened every time, right after the Civil War. What happened? Black people began to rise up. They began to get uh, economic uh, power. They began to get legislative power. They began to live the dream that this country is supposedly made of. And so what did they do? The idea that if you build something that intentionally over 400 years, you have to dismantle it with the same intentionality. And that doesn't mean like three extra points on your college admission test. Like yeah. that's not it. I mean, mm. Dismantle. He's talking about the constitution. For much of the last decade, at the behest of the Chinese Communist Party and the globalist agenda, the American left, in cooperation with big tech, corporate media, and major corporations, have been hosting what I'm calling the trial of the centuries. The US Constitution is on trial. It has been charged with the murder, degradation, and disenfranchisement of black people. If found guilty, the left will use the conviction as justification for sentencing this country's founding document to the death penalty and joining a new world order that models China's authoritarian communist government. Earlier in the trial of the centuries, the left called corroborating witnesses such as celebrated author Ta-Nehisi Coates, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, New York Times reporter Nicole Hannah-Jones, coaching legend Greg Popovich, fentanyl addict and career criminal George Floyd, and of course the mute Muhammad Ali of social justice Colin Kaepernick. We're now in the closing arguments of the trial where witness testimony is strung together to form a narrative that explains why black people are not closing educational, economic, health, family, housing, and crime gaps. The left's dream team is arguing that Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Ben Franklin, and the founding fathers assassinated black people at the formation of this country. 
They laced the De Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights with just enough racial bigotry to blunt the rise of black people. Eli Mistal, a Harvard miseducated pundit, began the left's closing argument on The View in early March. He trashed the Constitution. Watch, listen for yourself. So are you arguing for throwing out the Constitution? Should the Constitution be thrown out? What do we do? Is it a living document is it a, or is it a sacred document? It's certainly not sacred, all right? Let's start <laughs> there. The Constitution is kind of trash. Now, let's just, again, let's just talk as adults for a second. What did you say? It's what? It's kind I of tra trash. Trash. It was, it was written by slavers and colonists and white people who were willing to make deals with slavers and colonists. They didn't ask anybody to look like me what they thought about the Constitution. Mm -hmm. They didn't say, oh, Jim, come over here. What do you think about this old Constitution? Yeah. Well, Massa, I sure don't like how you sell my children. <laughs> Ms. Stahl and John Stewart, they're on the same team, the same dream team. They're arguing that the crimes committed against black people 240 years ago have more impact than the culture crimes committed against black people in the last 60 years. Stewart and Mistel are framing Jefferson and Washington for crimes committed by Lyndon Johnson's Great Society Welfare Initiative, Gloria Steinem's second wave feminist movement, Hollywood and the music industry's glorification of black criminality and debauchery. Over the last 60 years, the left sold black people a godless, hedonist, materialistic culture that undermined our pursuit of the American dream. Joe Biden defined blackness as allegiance to the Democratic political party. No group has swallowed the fallacy of success through embracement of liberal ideology more than black voters. In our quest for political power, black women have formed a stronger bond with men and women suffering sexual and gender dysphoria than with heterosexual black men. Our actions state we believe gay is the new black and trans people govern Wakanda. The political left captured our minds and immersed us in a culture that reimagines freedom as the courage to reject religious values and principles, see ourselves as victims, and place our fate in the hands of well-intentioned white liberals. The left committed a deadly thought crime. It trained black people to seek salvation through white people. The American dream is not the civil rights movement. The American dream is an individual pursuit. It's about a man or woman perfecting himself. The founding documents are laced with Christian ideas and values. Christianity is an individual battle. Social justice is about improving others. Christianity is about improving yourself. The secular values promoted to black people over the last 60 years made our path to the American dream far more arduous. That's the crime. That's what has murdered, degraded, and dis disenfranchised black people. The Dream Team wants to blame the failure of their policies to empower black people on white men who died 230 years ago. Yeah, our little welfare scheme and policies, that would all work if it wasn't for George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and those idiots. We'd have you dependent upon the government. We'd be rationing out freedom and food and all your supplies to you if it wasn't for those right racist idiots 200 and some odd years ago. And you'd be happy. They committed the crime, the leftists. And they're blaming people from 200 years ago. This is the equivalent of Johnny Cochran pinning the death of Nicole Brown Simpson on Bronco Nagurski the 1930s Chicago Bears running back. The audacity of this defense strategy is unprecedented. It's all based on lies and misinformation. Stewart argued that the infamous three-fifths compromise invalidates the Constitution. The three-fifths compromise punished slave-holding states. Abolitionists. Abolitionists, the people that wanted to end slavery. They, they did not want slaves to count towards population and therefore political representation. Southern states, slave owners, 
wanted the slaves to count toward population while, while the slaves held no voting rights. See, they wanted the extra people so the South would have more power. The abolitionists, the non-slaveholders, the people that wanted to end slavery, they forced the three-fifth compromise to hurt the slaveholding states. You have people arguing that this three-fifths thing was somehow some racist plot. It was a plot against the racists. And Jon Stewart knows it. He's lying. You've been lied to. You've never been taught history properly. You've been taking your history from rappers and other paid off idiots. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were documents written with an eye toward ending slavery. That's an undeniable fact. Eli Mistal is so vapid that he can't comprehend that the Constitution is a set of ideas and that looks do not determine ideas. It's irrelevant that no one looked like him. Brain function determines ideas. The Constitution was influenced by a biblical worldview. That influence is why the document has stood up for 246 years and eradicated unfairness from American laws and institutions. Stewart and Mistow are typical lawyers. The guilt of their client is irrelevant. It's all billable hours. The globalists want a new world order and a new constitution. Assassinating the character of long dead white men is the least of their crimes. Before I bring in Delano, I'm a, anybody that's watched this show probably already knows why. What John Stewart saying, arguing, American dream, unattainable for black people. Anybody that watched this show knows why I find this offensive. He's taking a dump on me and mine. I can't do this. He can. He's a white Jew. He can do it. He can attain the American dream. But I can't because I'm black. This is offensive on every level. That's a white Jew. Jews have been persecuted all over the world. He can make it in America, but I can't because of my skin color. Are you kidding me? And this, I don't, I know John, John, I know John Stewart is Jewish. I don't know if he has any faith at all. Based on his argument that he's making, I don't think he has any faith. When the man says, and I want to quote uh, directly, give me a second here so I can call it. <clears throat> the literal interpretation of the American dream is that, is that it doesn't matter where you're born or how you were born or who you are, that in this country you can rise up and go beyond that. <clears throat> so what he just stated is a biblical principle. And I, I'm telling you why it's a biblical principle, because he doesn't know it because he's thrown faith out the window or maybe he doesn't believe in Jesus or whatever. But, but that principle is based on Jesus born to an unwed mother in a manger somewhere. It doesn't matter. That's the lesson of Jesus. It doesn't matter where you were born, who you were born to, what your circumstances are. You can make it in this world. If you accept me as your Lord and personal savior, if you follow the plan God has set forth for you, those are the kind of ideas and concepts that founded this country, biblical principles. And so trust what he's arguing is a secular godless worldview. He's dressing up his satanic worldview very politely. They call it liberal ideology. And they want you to ingest a secular, godless worldview. And many of us have. And then you wonder why 
you don't get the results you want in this country. The whole thing is based on a biblical worldview, biblical ideas and principles. And then you reject those biblical worldview and principles and values and ways to conduct yourself. And then you get all. Oh, I don't like these results. I won't follow the obvious game plan that's been set out and put in a Bible and, and taught everywhere. I'm not going to follow. I'm going to reject it and adopt all of these political values, left wing political values, completely devoid of any biblical worldview. And now I ain't get the results. This country wasn't built for me. I'm an atheist. I'm a pagan. I'm satanic. I'm materialistic, I'm hedonistic, I, don't, I won't make any sacrifices, I just wanna be drugged up and a victim my whole life, and damn it, this world's not fair to me. Blow up the Constitution and make it fair for, us, for those of us who don't believe in God, who are satanic, who don't wanna make any sacrifices, make it work for us. That's the prescription they gave us 60 years ago. And those of you that have followed it and swallowed it, blew up your family, disavowed the patriarchy in favor of the matriarchy, have a woman in charge of your entire life and worldview, dreaming about transitioning. You don't like the results this world has given you? Blame yourself and the ideology and the ideology the ideology, the, the ideas, the political values that you bought and believe and subscribe to. Don't blame the Constitution. This is offensive to me. John Stewart, again, I don't know his background, but he ain't walked a mile in my shoes. I came from nothing. My father didn't graduate high school. Briefly locked up for selling weed, joined the army and turned his life around. My mother was a factory worker. My parents divorced when I was five years old. Me, my brother and my mother were living in a tiny apartment in the ghetto. Nobody saw me coming. Nobody expected anything from me but my mother, father and grandmother and brother, and, my, and eventually my stepsister, and stepmom, and stepbrother, when my father remarried. It's the only people that expected something from me, and demanded something from me. With me and my father in 1984, living in a 400 square foot, one bedroom apartment in the ghetto, John Stewart, sitting there with his little liberal white friends, oh, them ain't gonna never be nothing. They can't do what I did. They can't attain the American dream. This is racism. White, liberal, Jewish racism. That's what that man is espousing. And pretending like he's defending me. It's offensive. I, I am the American dream. My brother. Nothing. Beautiful home in Mason, Ohio. Two kids, two great kids. 20 year marriage. Awesome house. An executive with the Ford Motor Company. 10 years in the Air Force. My sister, my stepsister, an executive at Eli Lilly's, came from nothing. We used to go visit her and her mom and her, my stepbrother stacked up in a little ghetto uh, Section 8 apartment. Right off of 34th and Sherman, I can't remember the name of it.
This is racism. That's all it is. And they can dress it up and oh my God, you know, <laughs> I'm the good guy, John Stewart. <laughs> it's them dudes 200 years ago. They screwed y'all up. Uh, Delano, I apologize for the cursing uh, and the emotion, but I, it, it, I don't even have a great question for you. I just wanna, is the American dream unattainable for us as black people? Absolutely not, Jason. Um, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm in a Mike Todd mood today. I'm, I'm gonna try to be nice, but I've been agitated since this morning when I realized what our topic was. Um, one, one thing I wanna point out, right, is that Jon Stewart had a conversation made. Her name is Isabel Wilkerson, and they were actually talking about her new book, which I think is called Cast. Um, she's also the author of The Warmth of Other Suns, which talks about the great migration and how you know millions of black folks moved up out of the South in the 20th century to northern cities, so from Alabama and Tennessee to Chicago and Indianapolis and so on and so on and so forth. And what you see in their conversation is something you hit on, Jason. The Democratic Party has become a union between black feminism and white liberalism. That's why they get so upset when guys like us talk about the importance of marriage in the nuclear family, because to them that's an act of political bigamy. The, neither of the, neither group in that interracial relationship wants to let go and allow black men to take the place that we used to have. Now, in, in, in many respects, we black men are the one that opened the marriage, right? So we opened it a long time ago to, because we were convinced by our mates that this is gonna be better for us. And now what you see, particularly among you know, many black men on the left, is they stand over there docile, neutered, having to parrot phrases that they don't really believe because they want to keep this this relationship going because it gives them just a, a little little bit of power and listening because i listened to their entire conversation right uh i'm not saying i think isabel wilkerson isabel wilkerson gets much of the history correct her problem is when she moves from was to is Right. She goes from a historical analysis to saying this is what the country is today. And John Stewart, obviously, he's, he's going to play it up because he's in the League of White Knights. He's been doing this for a long time. Jason, I know, you know, when you talked about him on LeBron's show, The Shop and, and, you know, him putting a battery in the back of Draymond Green, talking about why the word owner is racist. So he is like many white liberals who has a ton of built up guilt that they that they need to, to get off their chest. But Isabel Wilkerson, even in her own biography, uh, undercuts her argument because the way caste systems work, like in India, you don't see untouchables on the TV screen. You don't see untouchables making millions of dollars a year, leading uh, uh, corporations and, and being VPs and big businesses. You don't see that. Isabel Wilkerson's father was a Tuskegee airman and an engineer, and she went to Howard. But like many black elites, whenever she has an opportunity to speak publicly, even if it's for 40 minutes or an hour, she will never tell black folk, hey, y'all, my argument is that this system and society is racist, but I made it and I'm going to tell you how to make it too. do these four things in this order and you can build a life for yourself. They never do that. It's always about how bad the society is, how racist everything is. And, and she, in many respects, is no different than the leaders of BLM, Black Lives Matter, the, the three co-founders who used the death of black men to argue that the, that the country is simultaneously systemically racist, but willing to give trained Marxists millions of dollars to BLM, buy large mansions. And, and this is a function of the black elite. This is all that they do. This is, all, this is their only play. They, they, they say that the country is devoid of resources, but when they come to a beggar seeking bread, they always withhold their hand. They'll never say, this is how I got some, and, and you can do the same thing. And Jason, I wanna be crystal clear. I'm not talking, I'm not saying everybody has to be a millionaire, a, millionaire, a superstar, an entertainer, or exceptional. 
I'm thinking when you talk about how offensive it is, I'm thinking not just about my parents and their own struggle. Right. And and, and, I, and I'm going to get to I, I want to deal with something very clearly be in the way people sort of at times pit black immigrants between, you know, black folk whose history stretches back since the beginning of the country. But I'm thinking about my father in law who came up sharecropping in r- rural Louisiana. Right. And how he moved to Houston and built a life for himself, his wife and his children. He, he, he did bush hogging on the side, clearing fields. He, he was a metal worker building uh, uh, burglar bars and, and, and barbecue pits. And worked hard enough so that his offspring, his son could start his own business and his daughter, my wife, could go on to college. Or my wife, um, her grandparents on a mater- maternal side, elementary school education. Right. Her, her grandfather had a third grade education. And those folks work hard enough and they, they kept their union together. Obviously, nothing is ever perfect. No relationship is ever perfect. If 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 I as an individual am somewhere, it ceases to be perfect. But they sent nine of their 13 kids to college during the Jim Crow era. And this story is not an exceptional story. This is how black folks were, were building from the point of emancipation all through the throughout the 20th century. So to me, it it really is sickening the way that these people are willing to trash the the folks who came before them and act as if America in 2022 is the same as America in 1922. And I I just wanna say this last part about the immigrant experience. One of the things, and I think this is a mistake of both the black left and black right, what they try to do is, is say, oh, America's not racist, this opportunity, Look how well these immigrants do, whether they're from Nigeria or, you know, sub-Saharan Africa or the Caribbean. And yes, that is part of the story. But I could tell the, the, the story of, of black folk in this country without even mentioning my family. Because all I have to do is look back to history. And, and, and I'm talking 1800s. Black people were building and early 1900s were building schools for themselves. Jason, Booker T. Washington wrote a book, Up From Slavery, where he detailed teaching folks who came out of the fields, right, teaching them by day at Tuskegee University, a university that the students helped build by day, and then teaching them vocational arts and and giving them a liberal arts education by night. This is in the history of black America. Do immigrants add to that? Absolutely. And you know the left is lying because they are in favor of open borders and more black and brown people coming to this country. And if you really thought that the country was so racist that it kept black and brown people, so to speak, in a caste system, you would never tell them to come here. Because when you eat at a trash restaurant, you don't give it five stars and tell tell your family, hey, you should go have your birthday party there. If you put your kids in a terrible school, you don't tell your, your sister's kids, I think you should enroll them there. So you know that they're lying, right? But they do this to amass political power. And as you said, their goal is to tear down what has been. Whereas the black folk of yesteryear, their entire focus was to build up for what yet is to come. Delano, I'm glad you hit on the point about this is all a political grab by elites. And and so... Isabel Wilkerson, John Stewart, Joy Reid, you name them, any of the elites in this corporate media structure, uh, they're trying, they've bought into the Democratic Party and their ability to gain power through the Democratic Party. They don't care about non-elites. Nothing Mm. they talk about is about empowering them. It's about how can I grab on to more political power? And so a lot of these black women, I'm just, they just flat out do not care about the black man. They don't feel like they need him. They don't feel like marriage is a real option for them or something they really want to invest in. They want to be their own bosses and they see the Democratic Party. Oh, look, Stacey Abrams, she can get, get a job. She ain't never won an election, but she can rise to power in the Democratic Party and, and go from, Uh, a credit score of zero to Mm. now they say she's worth $3 million. 
without having to accomplish anything. I guess she mm. registered some voters or whatever. But, but, but regardless, I, I just sit here and, and I hate to have an anecdotal driven worldview. But on this, I do. Because I've lived 54 years and I've amassed a great number of friends. And when I just start rattling through my friends, from Mike Atkins, one of my best friends in high school, and how he was living when we were in school. He, him and his two older brothers shared a bedroom in a little small mm. house, three of them. They was older than him, three of them, bed stacked up. You, you couldn't even walk in the room because there was just bed stacked up. Uh, mm. There was no room to walk. Mike Atkins living far better today than he ever did as a kid. Mm. I've seen him move up the left. Willie Clark, one of my best friends from high school, our, my best friend from high school, Mr. and Mrs. Clark, his sister in a small house in the hood. Uh, I'm looking at Willie now, family, off in a little sub uh, a suburban home, owns his own business, far better life than uh, he had growing up, has moved up the ladder. I'm looking at Chuck Kelly from Arizona, one of my college football teammates, owns his own business, uh, doing better, far better than he did as a kid. Tim Walton, uh, Stanford Young, Ralph Wise, uh, mm. Frank Barnes. Frank was doing pretty, <laughs> his parents actually, but Frank is doing better than his parents. Todd Fennell. I, I, I just across the board, for Marty McLean, we ain't even cool no more, but Marty McLean and where, he's, where his life has gone in, the, in this world. I just think of all of my friends, and I'm just saying, my brother, my stepson, anybody that avoided drugs mm -hmm. and put some work in, I've seen them rise. And I'm just sorry. If you avoided drugs and avoided impregnating women, I've seen them rise, period, end of story. If you put any strategy into this, I've seen you rise with, and so what, what why John Stewart and these people are telling, well, I know why they're doing it, to, to gain and hold on to political power. It's the only thing they have. But, but this is the crime of the century, mm. the, the total brainwashing of black people into a mindset that prevents our rise and eventually destroys us. This yeah. whole thing of claiming hip hop as our culture with all the profanity and degradation and debauchery that's associated with hip hop. That, that's, our, that's black culture and that's what being black is and uh, smoking weed and, and dealing drugs and making it rain at strip clubs, that's black culture. That's death culture. Mm. And, 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 and the people that are supporting that then turning around saying, some people 240 years ago, they got you. When, when they came up with the three-fifths compromise, which again was punishment. It was an incentive for slave states to walk away from slavery. Hmm. It's, I, I'm gonna give you the final word. I gotta keep it moving. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, you, you hit on all the points. And you, it, to a man like Jon Stewart, only white people have agency. Only white people can make um, individual rational decisions. Um, black people are dependent on the people who have agency. And the tragedy is that for a lot of black folks, we are going to end up making ourselves a supporting character in our own autobiography because we are following the lead of people like Jon Stewart. So, so this is why, again, Jason, I've said this many times on the show, when you, when you hear the average black Democrat speak about the issues that are holding us back, it's systemic racism and uh, uh, an unequal distribution of resources. And those problems lead to their only two solutions, better white people and bigger government. And that's just not gonna do. So I don't know, I don't know how we get out of this, but at a certain point, we, we have to stand up like Will Smith, right? I wasn't on last week when all the Will Smith stuff was going on, but we, we need to close this marriage and eject the third partner. Because this, this thruple menage a trois thing that we got going on since the mid-60s is not working. And anytime you hear black folk trash a black man who says, hey, 
uh, I'm advocating for the black family. I think black men should marry black women before, before both parties have children. I think we should get rid of trash culture that degrades black women and promotes violence between black men and, and encourages black teenagers to be, to be drunk and high and doped up on lean all day. That's the type of thing that I want to advocate for. And, he, and here, come, here come the black liberals, the college educated ones. Oh man, you, you, those right wing talking points. You, you serve in white supremacy. This is, this is a sickness. And again, I'm not sure how we, how we get out of it politically speaking, but what we're doing now is going to destroy the black community if we don't find a way to turn it around. I'm gonna end it on this note, and I, I hate to say it, but it, it is how I authentically feel. It's mm. how I think. I wish that someone like John Stewart had the guts to consent to an interview with somebody like me. And, mm. and I, I would dare this man to sit up and make the argument that the American dream is unattainable for black people, because I promise you, if he did, I would do what Will Smith did to Chris Rock. I slapped the <laughs> shit out of him and tell him to keep our names out of your mouth because you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, thank mm. you, Delano. Thank you, Jason. Uh, yeah, uh, good ranchers, and, and I mean this authentically, guys. You, you gotta, we're in a culture war. It's obvious. Th these people are trying to overthrow our Constitution and a way of life that has served all of us. They're brainwashing people. They're lying to them. This is... You know, I got a whole script here about Good Ranch, but you got to support these guys because they support us. They support what we believe in. And so, again, we all have to eat. We all have to nourish ourselves. We all love meat. Why not get it from people who support American farmers and ranchers, who source all of their meat right here through America? It's great stuff. I eat it myself. I feed it to my family. I've turned my friends on to it. But again, if you want to be a part of trying to push this country a healthy direction, you gotta make decisions with your pocketbook as well. Can't just come and watch the show and lay I like Jason and oh, I watched Tucker Carlson or oh, I did blah. You gotta support, th these businesses have turned against us, and that's why you have to support good ranchers. You gotta eat. They got great prices. You can lock it in and in inflation-proof your price of, of steaks and chicken and seafood, hamburgers. Great prices, support a business that supports you and our way of thinking. Go to goodranchers.com slash fearless or punch in the promo code FEARLESS. Get yourself one of them nice little $30 discounts uh, by punching in the promo code FEARLESS or going to goodranchers.com slash FEARLESS. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. Be a good soldier, support Good Ranchers. Uh, Royce White, next. All right, welcome back. I'm going to predict the show's going to get a lot more smarter because uh, Royce White is about to join us, and I can't wait to hear his take on John Stewart's assertion that the American dream is unattainable uh, for black people. Uh, Royce, uh, what are your thoughts about that assertion? Well, thanks for having me back, man. I appreciate it. Um, you know. <clears throat> This is a fantastic example that we can use to teach. And so that's, that's what I came into this, you know, this episode today thinking about is how to teach the audience. And so, you know, take the spiritual out of it for a second. Take the spiritual crisis and, and the abnegation of God and faith out of it for a moment. The two biggest political issues or ideas of our time are racism and globalism. 
And both ideas can be traced back as far as our historical record goes, right? You, you can talk about racism all the way back to Egypt, which is 5,000 years ago, or uh, uh, globalism, let's say, with the Roman Empire, even back as far as Alexander the Great and some other dynasties across the world. But relevant to American society today, they can both be traced back to slavery, the East India Trading Company, and the British Empire. Um, and the British Empire was stalled by the American Revolution. And it was picked back up or restarted after World War II with the post-World War II uh, liberal democratic order. Um, and since then, racism has been used to justify globalism. And it's one of the, it's one of the biggest socio-political scams running uh, today. And, and what John Stewart, so when John Stewart says that black people have been cut off from the American dream, He's telling the truth. It's an accurate statement. But what he fails to mention and what most of the liberal uh, puppets or figures fail to mention about that circumstance is that it's liberal policies that have been conspired on with the re Republican uh, uniparty that have cut black people off from the American dream by way of welfare, the welfare state and abortion. OK, and, and so, you know, uh, it, it's it's funny for me to watch. You know, it, it's frustrating, but it's it's funny at times as well because um, you know the the liberal establishment has continued to push the idea that Republicans are the racists and and they are the the all uh, the all encompassing all inclusive uh, uh, political party. Royce, they've done it as a political strategy to, cause again, one of the great tactics is, hey, white guy, if you don't wanna be accused of being a racist, be a Democrat, be a liberal, and you can avoid anyone ever calling you racist because we've created this brand that, you know, is racism proof. It's kryptonite for any allegations of race, no matter how racist we are. Uh, and so it, it's a great strategy. I, I, I love your explanation of how it's partnered with globalism. Could you elaborate that on that just a little bit more, how they work hand in hand in getting people to buy into, hey, you know, we need a country without borders and we just got to partner up with all everybody around the country because America's so racist, it's going to take the whole world. Uh, to protect you seems to be the argument. Yeah, well, you, you got to go back in American history again to sort this out. And, and, and we have to understand that, you know, what America was supposed to be in, in, its, in its inception was a nation of shopkeepers, the independent business owner. OK, and, and that, that that the independent business owner, coupled with the Second Amendment, created a safeguard against economic imperialism. That was the American Revolution versus uh, the British Empire. And so what, what happened post-World War II is the entire Anglosphere came back together in response to Hitler and the Axis powers and said, now we have a perfect opportunity to use racism and the, the, the unequal distribution of power and resources to justify bringing everybody together under a giant global welfare state. And so their, their, re their resolution to the inequality that came by their own hand is not to say we're gonna give everybody equal access to the game. They wanna say there's no way to give everybody equal access to the game. So our response now is to give you universal basic income or a basic income and, and a material high that's so good uh, that, that you won't really recognize that there's, that there's an inequality that's, that's gotten out of control, which is evident uh, in, in them going after the working class and middle class, but they also want the middle market. The middle market entrepreneur of, of, of American shopkeepers, again, was supposed to be the safeguard of independence against economic imperialism. When you take independent shopkeep, shopkeepers and the Second Amendment and merge them together, you get a safeguard, a national safeguard against economic imperialism and globalism. Royce, you just described my father, carried a gun, owned his own little small business in the inner city, and that's how he took care of himself and me and my brother. And uh, I, 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 you like explain 
my worldview, some, sometimes I listen to you talk and I'm like, well, that's why I feel that way or that's why. And, and so when you start talking about, because I think about all the time of how Walmart and all these global corporations have run all the mom and shop and independent shop owners out of business. And so, and now that's why all these global corporations have so much influence, unchecked influence. And, and, and it's, they get to decide what laws should govern the people. The people don't get to decide. And, and it's just like the whole system that allowed my father to come up from real bigotry and establish his American dream, home ownership, a business that took care of him and allowed him to provide for me and my brother. Uh, that system is being eviscerated and everybody is being told that the government can ration out some money, some stimulus money to you, a cell phone to you here and there, some food stamps or EBT card here and there, and, and that's going to create happiness and freedom or again, I, I don't even think they think it's gonna create freedom, that they're actually telling us you don't need freedom. Freedom's overrated. Uh, <laughs> and, and, there, and so why, and again, I didn't, I'm just telling you, I listened to Trump's inauguration speech and because I had not taken him very seriously until I heard his inauguration speech and I go, well, this dude's sitting here talking about my mother and factory workers. And, and working class people, and, and, brought, and it's just like, hold on, I gotta take a whole different look at this because I'm being lied to, and, and he's now starting, and again, it will never matter how much money I make or, or whatever, I'm never going to disavow or run away from the people that came to my father's bar, they were factory workers, mailmen, uh, laborers, uh, and, and my mother was a 30 year factory. I'm never going to uh, become an elite or, or adopt an elitist mentality. I don't care how much, I'm always gonna be the factory worker, the guy that went to the bowling alley on Wednesdays in a bowling league. That's gonna be me forever because those people deserve what my parents experienced, pushing me and my brother farther along in life and then me and my brother turning around and making life easy on my mother and father in their golden years. That's the American dream, and that's why I'm so offended uh, by, by John Stewart, because I'm living it. My mother is living her best life, her last 20, 25 years, on this, for the, because of the sacrifices she made for me and my brother. It, it's, it's, Anyway, I'm just going to throw the ball back to you without a without yeah. a great follow up question. No, that, that I, I agree with you. So and, and here we see how racism and globalism and the class, right, classism as a ping pong in between the two are used in two directions. Right. And, and where you're saying there are plenty of black people that have been able to recognize or realize the American dream. Um, my take is is in the reverse direction to say that the establishment has used black people and the and the, the 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 stonewalling of the American dream systematically to now blow it out to all races, right? And, and so, what the American dream really is at bottom is the understanding that a Judeo Christian value structure puts a premium on independence, okay, and that in that independence, economically, you could go from being nothing. Uh, and, and move yourself up the social ladder uh, in terms of uh, economics. Um, if you take away the oligarchy and the monarchies of, of the old uh, Anglo, Anglo-Saxon Anglo world. And, uh, you know, that that was working here in America. Um, and, you know, what, what makes it so corrupt to me from Jon Stewart is it's like, Right when black people are at the precipice of being able to access the American dream that they were traditionally kept out of at certain points of America, now they want to go to a global citizenship. You know, just as black people are starting to to, to identify um, the, the institutions and, and policies that have systematically kept them from accessing the American dream at a certain clip, now we want to go to a global citizenship. 
Um, I mean, black people and, and the American people should be offended when, when Jon Stewart does that. Now, the question, you know, I think Jon Stewart's a, a, a brilliant guy. Uh, I, I tend to think that he's pretty entertaining. He had a, an incredible career. He has been indoctrinated and, and completely aligned himself with this liberal ideology. And I'm not sure if he sees this perspective or not. Uh, but I will say that if he doesn't, this is an example of how that liberal ideology uh, just kind of brings people into the fold w without without a, a deep understanding of the history. Let, uh, we'll end here because I, th I think we both said this, but I, I'm just going to I want you to elaborate or clarify or restate once again. They are framing people that died 200 some odd years ago for the policies they instituted 60 years ago that have black people in a culture, immersed in a culture that doesn't lead to success in America. And so when, when you know, the, the Constitution and these founding documents are laced with Christian principles and values, and we have been talked into over the last 60 years of throwing off all of our Christian values and taking on secular values, of instant gratification, sexual pleasure, uh, destruction of family. And, and so it, it, it really is, I mean, they're a brilliant defense team that has framed someone else for a murder they committed. Absolutely. Um, you know, that they've created a time capsule and the time capsule has put black people and, and the working class by and large uh, back in the days of slavery and completely uh, kept us in the dark about the, the post-World War II uh, liberal democratic order policies that were put in place to, to systematically attack the American citizenship and the working class and use black people and, and, and slavery as a stopgap and as a, as a marketing tool. Thank you, Royce. Uh, we're going to move on. Glenn Beck's going to uh, jump on the show with us. Uh, we'll be back with the uh, great Glenn Beck. Next. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to keep it rolling and head out to Dallas and bring in uh, the great Glenn Beck. I don't, to me, uh, Glenn Beck is the foremost authority and has kept us ahead of the conversation on this new world order that uh, the left and globalists are plotting. And I see the attack on the US Constitution as the key element uh, of this new world order, this globalist agenda that they're trying to, to do. And it's all attached to being, we're, we're gonna unseat, undo, have an insurrection on the Constitution by arguing that the founders were so racist and these documents are so racist and they didn't represent, uh, t take into account black people and others and transgenders and whatever. So we just need to throw out the Constitution. And so what, when I hear John Stewart making these assertions, the, the uh, uh, American dream is unattainable for black people because of the three-fifths compromise in the Constitution, and, and we heard the Eli Mistyle a month ago. This is, they're trying to start the conversation about why we need a new Constitution, and I, I see it as all part of a plot, and so I wanted to bring on the guy I think that knows the most about uh, <laughs> what's going on here, Glenn Beck. Glenn, Yes, sir. A am I wrong? Am I wrong for no, thinking except that John Stewart and these guys? Go no, ahead. you are absolutely right. On I mean, anybody who brings up a three fifths compromise has no and uses it as a, as a uh, weapon against the founders has no idea what they're even talking about. You can immediately dismiss whatever they say after that. If they don't get that, they don't understand anything. Um, uh, but I, there's one thing I would disagree with you on. Um, that you see that the the attack uh, for this new world order is on the Constitution. Yes, they have laid groundwork to go around the Constitution, but the real attack is on the family. And you understand that this this the 
the family is the fundamental building block of all life. And they are dismantling it every single way they can. This is beyond just political, financial. This goes all the way down to the fundamental building block. We are, if, if we don't wake up soon, we're going to be in, in real trouble. But I wanted to bring something in that I showed you that you had never seen before. Um, and you just have to ask yourself, why didn't I? Why was I never taught this? Because John Stewart even, you know, was talking about those high ideals and they didn't even mean them. Yes, they did. Um, this is the first draft of the Declaration of Independence. It's four pages. It is an engraving made by Thomas Jefferson's son around 1829. Um, but it's an exact copy of what he wrote before it went back for Congress to sign it. Um, it's in his handwriting, and you'll see there are things that are scratched out from time to time. And it's just like a Word document. Off to the side, it'll say J. Adams and then the date, or B. Franklin and the date. Who made the changes to this? Um, and there's only four words that are printed in this and the, um, uh, the final draft. United States of America. Those are printed and capitalized. Now... That remains true in the final draft. But I got this draft, never taught this in school. I got this draft, and I noticed that there are two, more, two other words. One is capitalized, and one is just printed. So capitalized and printed, and one printed and underlined. Those two words are Christian and men. Now, let me, let me tell you what... Nobody has been taught in school that everyone needs to understand. The Declaration of Independence is a, a list of here's who we're going to be. You don't know us. We find these things to be self-evident. We're going to set up a government that believes these things, and we're going to break up with you, and here's why. That's called the usurpation part, the here's why we're breaking up with you. And they're generally all about one line. And it goes on for a page and a half, one line, two lines of all the things the king has done. The last usurpation is half a page. Now, I want to read it to you. The king has waged a, cu a cruel war against human nature itself by violating its most sacred right of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him. He captivates and carries them into slavery in another hemisphere or to incur miserable death in their transportation. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the war warfare of printed, underline, Christian king of Great Britain. So he's saying right here, this is Thomas Jefferson by himself in a room, writing this this is a guy who calls himself a christian the christian king of great britain and he is determined to open a market where capitalized men shall be bought and sold so when people say thomas jefferson how can you listen to him he didn't even know all men are created equal meant all men no he did and you can see the passion in this paragraph because his handwriting changes uh, in a, 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 it keeps an open market where men should be bought and sold. He has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this mi uh, miserable commerce and that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguished die. He is now exciting those very people to rise in arms among us. To purchase that liberty which he has deprived them of by murdering the people upon he is also uh, 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 brooded them, I think. Thus paying off former crimes uh, committed against the liberty of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another. He goes on to say, we have tried to stop this over and over, and he has blocked us in every single attempt. This is the only paragraph of the things that the king did that they wanted to stop. 
This is the only one that lays it out and comes directly from Thomas Jefferson. This was not um, this was not included in the final draft. Now, let me ask you why. Why, J- why, Jason? Why, why wasn't it well, included? My understanding is that all 13 colonies had to agree on everything in the Declaration of Independence, and only 11 of the 13 agree. Exactly right. So the final draft says a, a unanimous Declaration of Independence from the Congress of the United States of America. Because they voted before this was ever drafted, John Hancock got up and said, you know, the king, he is going to separate us. If he can find an inch of daylight, he will use that hole, that crack, and he will get between us and he'll tear us apart. And then we're all dead. So they said, he said, we have to take a vote. Does it all have to be unanimous? They voted on every line in this out of this incredibly racist uh, country. There were only two colonies that voted that that not be included. It wasn't Virginia. It was South Carolina and Georgia. Those two states, 11 said, yes, we want an end to slavery. If the um, if the 13 colonies, uh, if the northern part up from the Mason Dixon, actually up from Georgia and South Carolina, If you would look and say, when did New England and those states uh, down around Pennsylvania, when did they stop uh, all kinds of uh, any kind of slavery? You would they would be if it was a nation, they would be 50 years ahead of every other nation on Earth. But we don't get that credit because it wasn't all 13 it was over half of them, but they were 50 years ahead. Th- these people were the exact opposite of what John Stewart is talking about. John Stewart, the our founders. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't slave owners among them. Thomas Jefferson was. Thomas Jefferson tried over and over to change the law. You could not give up your slaves if you were in debt. Because they were viewed by the king as as furniture, as property. And he could not get that law to be changed because there were people in Virginia that did want it. But he didn't want it. Our founders didn't want it. George Washington didn't want it. Benjamin Franklin certainly didn't want it. And he tried his whole life. He died in debt. So just like the house, you have to take and pay off all of your debts after your death, and they're sold to other people. That's what happened with Thomas Jefferson. He was against it, against it. He inherited his slaves, by the way. I I, I, want to go back to this point where you think we disagree that I don't think we disagree, because I see the attack on family uh, in, in the same sense in yeah. terms of the, the, the principles and values that inspired and are found in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution, it, it, it's a biblical worldview. I'm not saying that everything in there is biblical, but the ideas and concepts come from a biblical worldview. It, it, and it, the Constitution is written almost directly from the Bible. I I could show you sometime. I'd love to show you the, the, the phrases, but all of the concepts in the constitution are biblical. Doesn't mean you have to believe in the Bible. (laughs) But again, and so our country was founded and one of God's strongest principles and beliefs is procreation, family, yes, man, woman, child, And so it's all connected together in terms of like, if you're, they want a secular society that doesn't believe in biblical principles. So, and and one of the strongest is family, or the strongest. That that is, that's supposed to be your representation of God's kingdom, the family you build and put together and support. 
That is the kingdom here on earth. So, and yes, they are trying to destroy it. So let me ask you this, and, and you know, I, I get slammed for saying this, but I, I think you understand this. I don't really care what the people are trying to do. I believe in evil, and I believe that this is a force against God himself, all of it. This is, this is the war in heaven between, you know, Satan and the angels and God. This is the same thing over and over and over again. And it's not just about uh, controlling people and taking away their right to choose their own path. That's, by the way, that is the American dream. It is not a house, a car, a big job. It's just to be able to have your own mind and be able to chart your own course. That's it. FDR and the progressives through Stuart Chase changed the American dream to success. That wasn't that until the 1930s, late 1930s, early 1940s. So he's wrong on that. And every time someone tries to take away your options, and I'm not talking about murder, I'm talking about options that the nature's God and, uh, and nature itself uh, have spelled out, anytime they try to, uh, to take that away and, and twist it, it becomes an attack on God. They are, they are trying to destroy the family, our, our God-given rights. They're doing these things because I think this is a movement of evil, of true biblical evil. Doesn't make necessarily... Uh, in, go ahead. I'm in total agreement with you. The only thing I would add to it is... It, there's an attack on family, yeah. but there's also just a fundamental attack on truth. Yeah. And, and any time you attack the, the truth, that's an attack on yeah. God and at who, the end of the day. Because yeah, the truth is what sets you free. The truth is what, is, is what allows you to achieve anything. And so once they take the truth away from you, you have nothing. You, 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 we, that's why we can't, and again, feelings are now in control of our society. Yeah, bad. Fe feelings, and so, oh, I feel like a woman, even though I'm a man, that's more important than the truth of the fact that you're a man. Yeah. And so, we're building laws and customs and normalcies built around people's feelings, which are very flimsy and very, you know, can change from one moment to the next. God's truth stands the test of time. For eternity. It is. And, and so they're taking the truth away. If you look at Isaiah, he talks about a refiner's fire. Um, I don't know if I've ever told you this. The blaze was named after um, George Whitfield's paper. He was the first real evangelist. He's the guy who got us to the Declaration of Independence. Um, he gave sermon, sermons in the open air because no pastor wanted to uh, have him in. Um, because he didn't belong to any church. He was just a God guy. And three quarters of the nation heard him speak in open air by 1770. Firsthand, think of the traveling that guy did to, to speak to that many people. He had a newspaper. It was in Georgia. Um, and his newspaper was called The Blaze. And that's what I named it after, because that's the purifying fire. Anything, anything that disagrees with eternal truths will be burned away. But as long as you have the truth, as long as you're standing in the truth, that fire does not burn truth. It only burns the imperfections and distortions of that truth. That's why, that's why I named this The Blaze. We must pursue truth and any imperfection. If we don't burn it out, it will be burned out. The, the amazing thing is, is that Satan really thinks he's going to win. I mean, he can make a lot of trouble and we'll be miserable for a while until we find the truth again. But I think he really thinks he's going to win. 
I, I, I'm t it's a struggle for me, Glenn, just I'm going to be honest with you, be transparent. It, it, I've never seen it, and again, I've only lived 54 years, but I, I've just never seen what the kind of wickedness no, neither and have I. hostility towards truth that we're living through right now. And, and it, it just, it does scare me. It, it makes me say, well, well, we're going to blow this. We're, we're, yeah, I, <laughs> we're going to blow this. I will tell you, Jason, I am hearing from a lot of people who, um, I think the Lord is doing something to everybody. And will you listen and obey? You know, you'll really have to, we're entering a time now where I really think you need to be so in tune with the spirit because it might just save your life on what, what the spirit says. Stop. Don't go there. Stop. Don't say that. Stop. Whatever it is, you have to know what the spirit sounds like because we are entering those times where, I don't know if you saw the New York Times piece on Christians um, and how they made Christians just look like political devils um, that are crazy in today's New York Times. Um, they will come for the religious. They will come. This is not going to stop. You can't stop this system now um, easily, easily, uh, because they won't do it. They, If I can't have it, no one will, I think is kind of their their place. But I think God is um, planting in the hearts of people things that they are to do, and they may not even understand them yet, but they need to do it, and they need to stand in place. God is um, all peaceful things, but God is putting people into place, I, I, I believe. The question is whether we'll listen to him. Will we listen? Well, good. Well, Glenn, I hope people uh, listen to us today, and I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're very busy. No, but please. On, when, when, Anything when for you. talking about the Constitution. Yeah. yeah. I don't know anybody that knows more about this than you, and I appreciate you. You've shared those documents with me in person. I'm glad you shared them with our audience. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. God bless. All right. God bless you as well. Uh, we're going to go to the Shamok Show. Shamika Michelle, probably the only person I know that can follow Glenn Vex act and do a great job. Shamika, All right, welcome back. Uh, time for Shamika Michelle uh, to join us. Uh, Shamika, uh, we've been talking all day about John Stewart and the American dream. Is it is it unattainable for black people? You agree with John Stewart? I definitely don't agree with John Stewart, and I wish that white people who desire to kiss black ass. I wish they would actually think about what they say before they open their mouth. This is especially offensive to me for three reasons, Jason. One, as a product of rape, born to a 15-year-old girl. Two, as someone who was raised in a church with biblical values. And three, as an American citizen. What he said is offensive for these three reasons. When I think about my childhood and what I was taught, I was never given an excuse to be less than. I understood that I had to work hard, but it never felt like a burden. It never felt like something that was said to me because I was oppressed. Like who wants to be mediocre? 
I call you some days after the show, Jason, to get your feedback, not because I'm black, not because I feel like because I'm black, I'm stupid and I can't do it. I call you because I know that with guidance and direction, I can set the game on fire. Like I believe that I have everything that I need to be the best that I can be. So for John Stewart to say that I can't do this because I'm black, it's foolishness to me. When I think about the way that I was raised in church, you know, what to say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, John Stewart is saying, mm, well, actually you can't because you're black. If I say, if God be for me, who can be against me? John Stewart is saying, Whitey, the white man has his foot on your neck. You can't do it. I know God said you can, but you really can't. If I say my gifts will make room for me and bring me before great men, John Stewart is saying your skin color outweighs what God has endowed you with. I have an issue with that. And so it bothers me that somebody would say these things against how I was raised with biblical principles and with my mother telling me that I can do anything that I put my mind to. And as an American citizen, it bothers me because I have had generations to come before me that fought to get me to where I am today. There is no reason that I should ever feel oppressed. And, and I liken that to when I go to someone's house, uh, Jason, I, I don't relax. You know, if I sit on the couch, I sit on the edge of my seat. I may look to the left and to the right just in case they have roaches. I don't really get comfortable. But when I'm in my own house, I sit back on the couch. Sometimes I even put my my feet up on the coffee table because I'm at home. That's how I feel in America. And I feel like generations before me fought so that I could feel like I'm at home. Like I can feel like this is my land. This is my country. And I feel like they don't want us to feel comfortable. They don't want us to feel like we're at home. They want us to feel that this is not really where we belong. And I, Royce has said this before, and you all talk about this all the time. It'll be easier to usher in global globalism if we don't value our nationalism. If we don't think this is our country, then we'll easily say, let's get rid of the constitution. Let's get rid of everything that says that I have rights right here in this land and, and go to, to you know what they want us to do and be one with China and be one with all these other countries that we can't trust. I'm not doing that. This is my home and this is my land. So as an American citizen, it bothers me that he wants to say black people don't have the right to the American dream or it's unobtainable. That's a lie from the pit of hell and I am not buying it. Shamika, uh, you can't, nor I or anybody uh, that's been on the show today, top what you just said. So I'm gonna let you go. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, this is, uh, and thank you. This is a child, a woman, born of rape to a 15 year old. And again, this is what I, I say about everything that he said is secular, it's godless. It, 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 it's, and this country was founded on biblical values and principles. And, and it was looking out for, it was not perfect at its inception, at its formation. But as Roy said previously, not today, but previously, the constitution is a self-perfecting document. It has gotten better and better and better over time. It has eradicated unfairness and made way for people like Shamika to come from nowhere and to be able to find some freedom, some comfort, some happiness, some self-sufficiency here in America. And just as she just demonstrated here, and she done watched Delano, Royce White, Glenn Beck, me, a bunch of men come in and say a bunch of really strong and compelling stuff. And she came in in four minutes and topped us all. Uncle Jimmy, next.
we must exist in a state of man glorious as we are protected by the red, the white, and the blue. But remember, the mind is the key. The fearless soldier pledges to place God first and foremost in his everyday endeavors of life. We, the fearless army, are one nation under God, indivisible with freedom and a belief in the American dream. The men bold enough to join our movement comprise what we like to call the new dream team. We are leaders of our families, our churches, and of this nation. We reject the seeds of division that are planted by corporate media misinformation. We affirm that all men are created equal and are endowed with inalienable rights, which are granted by our Heavenly Father. We are bound by honor to accept God's challenge, to take the flag and lead, to cherish, to protect, and to nurture the life of our unborn seed. I am a fearless soldier, so shed no tears for me. I am not a victim. I am the man that God made me to be. Amen. All right, welcome back. Time for my uh, favorite segment, second favorite segment uh, of the show. Jim, uh, we've had a fantastic show. Uh, Delano, Royce, Glenn Beck, Shamika, uh, my fire starter. Uh, anything stand out to you? Honest to goodness, first of all, I normally come out and give you a hard time, but this was an amazing show. The, the, this show was possibly, in my personal opinion, one of the best shows that you've done in a long time. Because it, I mean, because honestly, yes, Shamika tore down the house. Hey man, Glenn Beck is the man. I gotta be honest with you. If you listen to Glenn Beck talk, and I'm very serious, this man, his tone never changes, but his message his, uh, of what he says, who else in this industry brings the heat that Glenn Beck brings, man. This man is talking straight out. He says we as mankind might not even ex exist if we don't get this right. What, I mean, come on, what else is there to be said? Do you have your thoughts, again, I, the John Stewart, uh, Uncle Jimmy, can, can you, achieve, First <laughs> can of you all, achieve your The man American said dream. that the American dream is unattainable for black people. Yeah. Jason, is this how bad we've come as black people? We as black people, we in such bad shape that, I mean, because th th them was my leaders growing up, but we in such bad shape that just a white person just, how am I going to speak for the, for the black folks? I'm going to tell them what they need. <laughs> we, we in such bad shape that, you know, just any random white person can pick up the mantle and run for us, right? <laughs> well, we've certainly allowed that with black leaders as well, so why not? They just sit around like, Re Al Sharpton is y'all's leader? Hell, I'm more qualified. Let me do it. Jason, he said that the American dream is unattainable yeah. for black America. Now he, now, he said this. Now, do you know what the definition of unattainable means? I looked it up. I looked it up. Unattainable means not able to be reached or achieved. Mm, like my goal of getting under 300 pounds. <laughs> it, it's achievable. It is. It's achievable. I mean, but, but see, Jason, that's the problem. Man. That, and, and you said it, and I hate to go back. Roy said it. We live in a society that we think that you calling me a N-I-G-G hard E-R is going to damage me more than you telling me that the American dream is inobtainable for me because of my skin color. Now, now which one of those is really going to do me more harm? Well, I think someone could argue that him by telling you, by him telling you that the American dream is unattainable, he's basically calling you the N-word. That's just another, that's a repackaged way of saying, you're an N-word. But you isn't he also, do this. isn't he also saying that the American dream is only for white Americans? And a lot of people are buying into that. Okay, but let me ask you this. Then why did he, why is his name John Stewart and not John Leibowitz? 
Why did he drop the Leibowitz from his name if he wanted, you know? John Stewart's name used to be Leibowitz? Hell, his daddy's name is Leibowitz. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm about to look that up. <laughs> well, I'm just asking, bro. <laughs> oh, yeah, John Stewart Leibowitz. I'm just saying, so why did he drop Jonathan, the Leibowitz? Yeah, the Stewart was actually S-T-U-A-R-T, and then Leibowitz, so he, he's, he's running from his Jewish heritage, I guess. There you go. But, but he still managed to obtain and go through the struggles of the American dream and make it. Okay? See, Jason, look, man, I'm going to be honest with you. And, and I heard you, man, and you were talking about if we listened to what people told us, we would be right where they want us to be. You know, hey, man, the, the, probably the most important. He get it into existence, basically. He's people uh, but what does the, the Bible tell ball you? Ball. What does the Bible tell you? The power of the tongue. Yes. We keep on speaking our demise. You know, man, the most, man, the mo my most favorite person in the world is my father-in-law, Minor Gatchin. He, that's the man that taught me everything. That, that's, that's my ex-wife's husband, I mean, father, taught me everything. Fifth grade education. This man taught me how to, th this man had a fifth grade education. He had a fifth grade education because of all of the uh, 11 kids. He was the one that had to stay home and work the fields. But you know what? This man owned three houses, a camper, a boat, sent three kids to school and had a fifth grade education and could walk and measure a house without using a tape measure and figure up them numbers in his head like that. OK, so I've seen I've heard the American dream. Jason, I was born in Argentine, Kansas. You ever heard of Argentine, Kansas? No. But like Shamika, Shamika says, my, my, my mother, I was born to my mother 16 years old. You hear you've heard me say people laugh. I said, man, when I was in third grade, I went to school, came home and my mama moved. You heard me tell that joke, man. Hey, man, if I listen to man, if I listen to what my family told me to do, I wouldn't be here let alone listening to what some white folks told me to do. But you know what I did, Jason? And the reason I'm here, and I'm, th this is what upsets me about John Stewart and what he says, because, and you touched it, you said, I don't know what the religion. Hey, you know what, John? You know why you think that it's unattainable? Because you don't know this man by the name of Jesus. You understand? You don't know what happens when, if you believe in God and you try to walk in the light and you try to do a little bit of right, you don't know what God can do for you. See, this is what we need. OK, and this is why I'm here. This is why I'm saying what I'm saying, because, you know, I, I, I'm a product. I, I'm a product of his goodness, of his grace and his mercy. Not because of no man. I'm not because of my skin color. I'm here and I've achieved what I've done because of the goodness and grace of God and nobody else. And if you don't know that, John, you might want to meet him. All right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, we can go to our approval rating because I can't top that. I'm not going to try. Uh, job performance, uh, you know, he's a comedian. He's, I guess he's still funny. I'm going to give him a 20 in job performance. I used to like him, honestly. I mean, remember, he was Bill Maher before he was Bill Maher. <laughs> okay? Hey, man, but let's keep this in mind, man. Uh, uh, you know, this dude's been doing this show since September, and this is the eighth episode, and this is the only one that's done made some noise, so <laughs> he might be falling off a little bit. Come on, let's go. You gave him a 19. 19, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, character, I find him low in character. Uh, and I did, I used to like The Daily Show and, and thought, you know, he spoke some truth. Uh, but I'll give him a nine in character. I give him 18 because he don't, he, I don't know about his character, but you do know that he's the executive producer of the Stephen Colbert character. Okay. Stephen yeah. Colbert started on his show. That's right, yeah. You know, I mean, so I'm kind of hoping that I, Transform like Stephen Colbert. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Authenticity. I find him inauthentic. I wish I had known about his name change. I would have dropped him even more in authenticity. But I gave him an eight, uh, which you know, knowing his name change, I probably would have given him a four in authenticity. Because and for those very reasons, I gave him a nine. Okay, because <laughs> he t it, it, he talks about him coming up and he, him being the victim of anti-Semitic bullying. Okay, so honestly, man. And I, I don't know, how, let me ask you a question. How happy do you think people are at John Stewart for actually talking about this? You don't think there's people like, don't tell them that. Shh, don't let them know. Now he's been instructed to say that. This is an orchestrated <laughs> uh, game plan. It Factor, you know, he's an icon of the left. People love him. I gave him an 18 in It Factor. He just don't do it for me. He used to. I'm gonna give him a 10. 
Mm. I'm gonna be honest with you, Jason. He's starting to sound like you. Old and out of touch. <laughs> <laughs> He's older than me, man. And that, well, you need to quit acting like that, then. He's younger than you. <laughs> hey, but you know what they say. I, I, I look good you know, for my age. Yeah, all right. <laughs> well, we both got him at candlelit. I got him at 55. You got him at 56. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, that is. We both got him at candlelit. Speaking of candlelit. You know what? I got another song that uh, I got coming from, from a different singer about harmony. Very good. That'll be good. We'll hear some more of it tomorrow, I think. But anyway, that's tomorrow. I mean, we'll see you tomorrow. I just wanna be. I just wanna be. I just wanna be. I just wanna be. I just wanna. Looking like it's my time